Hello, Paris. Hi. Uh, wow. Um, I'm really excited to be about, uh, here in .js, and I hope you're enjoying it as well. Um, so I came here to tell you basically about a programming trick. I want to show you today how it's possible to capture all the dynamic values of a variable and specify them all only at the time of declaration of that variable. Now, that's a pretty long sentence, and that's why I have a presentation here to explain all that. Let's say you have this pretty simple JavaScript code, okay? Everyone here should understand this. You have a variable A, which is initialized as 3, and then B is set to 10 times A. So how, uh, what is the value of B? Well, as you can see, if you console log that, it's 30, obviously. Now, what happens if you just set A to 4, and you check the value of B? and it's still 30. It stayed unchanged. So what you need to do is call again uh, b, b assigned to 10 times a. And then you get b equals 40. So that was JavaScript. Let's look instead, uh, compare that to spreadsheets, OK? You have the same situation here where cell b1 has the formula 10 times a1. And it's updated automatically whenever A1 changes. So you don't need to say the formula again. So you only need to specify that formula once, and it declares what happens now and in the future. So I don't know what you think about spreadsheets, but they are the world's most, most successful programming environment for non-programmers, right? And why is that so? Well, they don't need to worry about state. They don't need to think about mutation, right? All they have is data, formulas, and automatically updating dependencies. So how can we get JavaScript to have a bit of these properties of spreadsheets? So this is what we normally do. Instead, we have whenever a, we set A, we need to also set B. We need to manually recalculate it. So if you look at the value of b over time, it starts at 30, and then it changes to 40 and 60. So if you unfold uh, these values over time, you see something like this plotted over time. And these values came from somewhere. They depended on the values of a. So there we also have a plotted uh, in time. And these were the assignment events that caused a and b to change over time. Now, with this assignment approach, we have two serious problems here. The first one is that you're repeating 10 times A here multiple times. So what if you make a typo and you write 11 times A, then you're going to get inconsistent data. OK, so you could put that 10 times A inside some function called update B, but then you still need to call update B multiple times, and you need to do that whenever you change A. So what if you forget to call update B, right? So then you also get some bad data. The second problem is, in that time window over there, A is already the number 4, but B is still 30. So between the assignment of A and the assignment of B, there's a time window there where you might read B equals 30, and that's not really what you want. You want it B equals 40. So these two problems happen because A and B are mutable state. Okay, so this is, for instance, the state of B over time. It's a value, and at any point of, you can write to it, and at any point you can read it, and it will have a value. So we can even consider undefined to be a value. So we can just assume it always has a value. However, these were the assign, uh, assignment events that happened on uh, B. So events are the complementary of state, okay? So it turns out the state and events are kind of like yin and yang, OK? They're sort of interconnected always. So these are just two sides of the same coin. The top one is B, the variable, and the bottom one is B, the event stream. We use dollar sign there to mean that, just a convention to say that it's a stream or an event stream. So both of these things represent the same concept, OK? State is just events stored in a cache so you can use them later. So you can either work with mutable state variables, or you could work with event streams. They are equivalent. Here's a very natural example of, of the yin and yang in real life. You have your age is state. 
But your birthdays, however, are events. So you don't need to store your age. What you can do is you can keep the stream of your birthday events. So sometimes in real life you don't remember what is your age. Sometimes I have that problem. And what you do instead is try thinking of your last birthday. Yeah. So we can get rid of state. Okay? State is relevant. Forget about state because we could just work with A and B as event streams. So here, event stream A has the values uh, 3, 4, and 6, or the events 3, 4, and 6. And B was created from A uh, using a certain formula. What is that formula? Well, it's the events of B are the events of A mapped to 2 10 times A. If you know JavaScript arrays, you've probably seen uh, the map on arrays. And it's the same idea. Given the uh, array on the top and a function, you get the array on the bottom. And this is an immutable operation. We're, we're not changing the top array any, anyhow. So, yeah. So it's the same thing here with event streams. We have the top uh, uh, event stream A, which we map, and we get a new event stream B, but A uh, stream just stayed untouched. So it's just like array map, but the difference is that this map happens for all of the events in the future, right? Whenever some new event comes in A, it will be mapped to 10 times A on B. So we give the name A dollar to, to the event stream, but the name A to the event itself. Why? Well, because the event is the value, and the value is the event. How does it look like in actual JavaScript code? We create A stream as an observable event stream with the predefined events 3 and 4. And then B stream is mapped uh, A, mapped 10 times uh, A. And we can subscribe to B stream. It's just like adding a, an event listener because it's an event stream. And then we can take that value B and we can put it in the console log. And then we see 30 and 40. Okay, so take a look at this declaration, okay? I find it really, really special. Because in a single line of code, we know how B stream will behave in the future, okay? We don't need to recalculate it manually multiple times. Uh, and B stream stays up to date with A stream as soon as possible. So this is starting to look really a lot like spreadsheets. And that's the magical property. So let's say you want to mutate B, okay? You want to set the value 60 to it. So then you call B.set. No, 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 you don't call B.set. <laughs> no, Beca why? Um, because, I, as I just told you, all, all of the future values need to be specified in the declaration. And the declaration is that line on top there. So we see that B stream depends on A stream, so we probably need to uh, call A.set to 6. No. As I just told you, uh, we need to put all of the values in the declaration of A stream. So that means that we need to go uh, to the first line, and we need to add the number 6 there. So now, A stream has all of its values defined there in the future, and B stream will react, and that's how we see 30, 40, and 60 in the console log. Okay, but wait a minute. In a real application, how are you going to know all of the future values for each of the event streams? Well, you, you don't. Uh, because, but you know from where will that value come from, right? For instance, in B, we know that it comes from A stream. So here's a common source of unpredictable values, the user. Okay? She generates all sorts of unpredictable values and events in the future. And we can capture those as an event stream, like we're taking here the event stream of clicks, and we're representing it as an event stream. So then we can change A stream to take those future values from the user, the clicks, and we can uh, count the number of times that the user clicked on the DOM. So that's what this scan does there. It keeps an accumulator function starting at zero. Every time you click, it's just incrementing that accumulator. So you're probably thinking, what is the scan? And what is from event and what is this observable? This doesn't look like normal JavaScript. So this actually comes from a library called RxJS. And the observables are the event stream. So scan and map and many others are called operators. 
And they are methods on the observable type which return you a new observable. So for instance, I showed you map, but it's also one of the basic ones. But there's also scan. And have you ever seen array.reduce? It's a similar concept. So it reduces all of the previous events from the past. So it starts from zero there. And then when it sees three, it adds zero plus three, and get three at the bottom. Then it holds three, and it sees four coming in, and it adds three plus four, you get seven. And it holds seven, and so forth. It's, so it's kind of like mapping them, but it has this memory that it keeps. And then you have filter as well. It works like the one, uh, it works like array.filter. And you have temporal operators like delay, which allows you to, well, delay events from the source event stream. And you have merge, and you have combine latest, and you have buffer and catch and concat and count and debounce and default if empty, delay, distinct and general change, do element add every first filter find. A lot of operators, apparently. So if you want to learn more, go check out uh, RxJS more at reactivex.io. It has a lot of good documentation there. And it takes some time to learn, but it's okay. Um, and observables are being standardized in ECMAScript. So you can expect to see them in ES7 or ES2016 or ES2017. Anyway, in some future ECMAScript. Right now, it's stage one proposal, which is pretty good. And that was reactive programming. So if you've ever heard of reactive programming before, now you have some idea of what this is about. And it gives you automatic updates between data dependencies. So, but there's something really nice about reactive programming that I want to share with you today, which is really exciting. And that's separation of concerns. So besides all of those nice things, it also gives you separation of concerns. Now how? I can show you an example. Actually, an example from real life right now. I am the speaker. And here's the uh, not reactive code yet. This is my function, me, Andre. And what I do as a speaker is that I show the first slide and talk about it, and I show the second one, show all the slides, and I talk about them. When I reach the last slide, what do I do as a non-reactive JavaScript piece of code? I iterate over every one of you in the audience. Like There's like thousands of people here, so I go like you, go get coffee, and then the next one, you, go get coffee, because it's the coffee break after this. You, go get coffee, and it keep, keeps on going on. So, that's pretty like a terrible idea for separation of concerns, right? Why should I be cared, uh, concerned with what you're going to do after this, right? That's your business. So this is you as a participant in the audience. So you have a caffeine level there. And a question. Can you detect how your caffeine levels will evolve just by looking at this declaration? No, because it's just initialized to 0 0.05. And you have no idea how it's going to evolve later, how it's going to be mutated, mutated. So what you need to do is look at all of the usages of go get coffee, that kind of stuff. So now I, as a speaker, have to take care of what you're going to do. So the arrow there is attached to me because I, am, I have the responsibility of saying, like, go get coffee, go get coffee. What if you don't want to get coffee? Like, what if you want to go talk to someone or go to the restroom? So then I need to introduce some kind of generic do something function, right? And all of you have to follow that contract, and I need to say go do something. Um, and this is starting to look very sort of like object-oriented type of thing where we have I does something interface uh, that each participant needs to implement. And you know, this is not real true separation of concerns. The speaker shouldn't have a list of uh, people who do something inside it in, in the first place. So what we need instead is something like this. Each participant uh, reacts to the speaker. That's where the name reactive programming comes from. And the speaker doesn't need to force them to do anything. So here's the reactive JavaScript code for me, right? Uh, I simply declare my slides as an event stream of slides, because that's the only concern I have. There's nothing else to give a good talk. And this talk is literally an event stream. Right? I have all of the slides from the future here already prepared for you. <laughs> and you simply import my slides as an event stream, and you define your own caffeine level according to my uh, last slide. So 
all of the coffee concerns are declared in the stream. It's not exposed anywhere. No one can mutate it. That's what's important. So by looking at it, even if you don't understand this code right now, if you learn some RxJS, you're going to be able to understand perfectly how this thing works now and in the future. So this is separation of concerns. You take care of your own caffeine levels, and I take care of the speech. And that is how you get the whole future declared in a var. Thank you for subscribing to my event stream of slides. This one was my last one. Thanks. <laughs>